today is uh, Alexander's Tuesday. We're called uh, call the doctor session. And um, I wanted to continue from my last month's talk about uh, HDFI file interoperability. And um, although I haven't looked my previous month's YouTube recording, I think I, I think I remember what I was talking about. And I think I tried to introduce so the three different levels of uh, file or data interoperability. And so the most fundamental basic level is what HDF5 library provides effectively uh, by creating files in one computing, computer system and then moving it somewhere else and still able to read um, the data in its most raw uh, HDF5 level. So the above that, I tried to talk about, now we are discussing how to store certain domain objects or certain domains, uh, scientific or engineering domains data in HDF5. And at that point, we are trying to use what's available from HDF5 data model and what's implemented by HDF5 library uh, and, and decide now how things are named and their various other storage properties. And so that's sort of, that's like a middle level of, um, HDF5 interoperability. And uh, that level means that once we agree or some community that agrees this is how we're going to store our data, then they're free to develop multiple implementations that support those things. Um, and then there is a next level of, of interoperability, which is sort of the application level, at which point there is a certain software application that says, well, your access to the data is through me only. And even if I give you this HDF5 file, most likely you will not recognize anything specific or not recognize how things that you think should be stored and where they are in this file. But I'm the software that you need to go through for reading and writing. Um, and, and for example, maybe there are some certain performance or any other uh, needs that really force uh, that kind of approach. Um, in some level, th th that level is very similar to HDF5 library and HDF5 file form. The basic HDF5 library creates this file format, and you know uh, we usually do not work directly with, with those bytes from those files. Um, so, with that, um, today I thought you know um, to talk about something more specific. And and um, where is it now? Uh, let's see. I'm pretty sure it's somewhere. What is it? Why is here? I think that's the one. Yes, that's the one. Let me destroy that one. Yes. Yeah. So I thought to talk about. Uh, specification for storing tabular data, but in a column, um, column, uh, column, columnar arrangement, basically. So um, I mentioned in my previous month's talk, there is a longstanding uh, HDF5 table specification um, that basically uh, introduced this idea of storing tabular data, but benefiting from compound data types. In other words, um, storing row-based, tabular data as row-based approach. And, um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's fine, no problem with that. And there are some really famous and highly successful um, software applications that, that essentially adopted this approach. Uh, one of the greatest examples is PyTable. If you go there, file format, it's very much adopting this compound data type, single HDF5 data set approach. Um, and so uh, now we are living in a world where um, we now think about there are other ways, and this way tries to store each column as a separate data. And um, this is what I'm going to sort of just throw out there and see how it goes. Um, so basically, here this this idea goes like this. So anywhere in HDF5 file hierarchy, there's going to be a one HDF5 group uh, with certain attributes that will say, well, from here down, 
I'm actually representing a, a table. And and uh, and that group I call table group uh, for the lack of a more uh, marketing friendly name. Uh, and uh, and I'm just trying to import as many uh, special name attributes from from the previous pass. And for example, that that group will have an attribute named class with a specific value which says column table. So if you look at the HDF5 uh, row table specification. That one only said class with the value of table. So we're now talking about, you know, a little bit more. We're now calling this column table. And also another required attribute would be version with some kind of versioning identifier. What is going on in the, in the content under this group? Uh, I, right now, I, I'm not particularly <laughs> preferring one way or the other how this identifier should look like. So I left it unspecified. Um, this group can have any other number of uh, HDF5 attributes and, and maybe some other user communities are free to define something more specific to them. But um, I kind of reserve now two attribute names for something and one is title, which should be what would be the table's title, for example. And the other is description, which is just the free form text with whatever the creator of the table thought would be useful to anyone using uh, the table's data. Uh, could be summary, could be abstract, could be anything else, just some kind of a text. Um, from there, basically under this group, we have a bunch of HDF5 data sets and these data sets now represent one column. So every data set is one column. Um, and here are the properties of these data sets. Uh, uh, the name of this data set under the table group is essentially the column name, and they are treated as Unicode strings. So let's see how many Unicode code points can HDF5 library accept for these names. But I thought that's the easiest way as one can get. Um, they're all one dimensional and all chunked data sets. Um, any HDF5 filter available and supported um, is allowed to be used on each of these uh, column data sets uh, because basically that, that's what HDF5 library allows. No need to be more restrictive, I think, at this point. Uh, however, also chunk shapes and filters are allowed to differ. You can standardize if someone wants, but they can differ. Uh, and for example, maybe some columns that would benefit of having larger chunks, some maybe not up to various people, but basically um, let's give freedom here and, and uh, to people to implement how they feel. Uh, here we get a little bit more restrictive. So any HDF5 data that is allowed except object and region reference. I thought that's pretty much, I didn't see where they could fit as a column value, but for column data, Values, but let's see, maybe I'm wrong. However, there is a little nudge um, to those who prefer to use uh, variable length data types that if they can avoid them. And this is more looking towards cloud computing and cloud object store access because um, in the current implementation of variable length data, in HDF5 library, you kind of do not have a clean block of bytes when those, those data are. And so if these, those files are ever going to end up in some kind of cloud object store, um, they're really not friendly um, for cloud-based access. So if someone wants to use strings and they are happy to know that maybe they'll never need more than 100 characters, um, then probably said, say 100 characters. Do not just, well, I can make it variable length string. Yes, you can, but uh, maybe that file will end up in the cloud of it and that should be avoided for now. Uh, compound data types are not prohibited really, but are really discouraged to be assumed that, oh, I can shuffle a mini table now here of couple of columns in, in a compound data type. It's really meant only to be used in cases where, uh, in cases where uh, it makes sense as a column column value, so for example, classical case would be complex numbers. 
because right now HDF5 data type, HDF5 library does not support complex numbers. So you would have to have some kind of a complex number storage for them. And, um, you know, that would be where compound data type would probably have merit. Another one is, again, if you want to store some kind of, a, say, wind direction. Uh, it's another classical example. And you at least have so-called U and V components or, or north and east, whatever you want to call them. And so um, should they be in the separate columns? It's up to the person to decide. But if you kind of would access them as, as, as combined things, then you can still use a compound data type. Um, the most important feature here, obviously, is that all these column data sets are kind of synced together uh, so that you know any element in one column represents and the, that index of that element in one column represents the same row in all the other column data sets. Um, that's one of the benefits of the previous sort of more, I won't call it older, but let's call the row column specification because this is where this was not a problem. Uh, basically, all columns were written at once, and the synchronization was essentially done by the library and by the, the way how data was uh, stored. In the case of column HDF specification, column table HDF5 specification, this is not the case. You kind of the software implementation will have to take care of this synchronization. Um, again, this column data set can have any number of attributes. Um, one more obvious one, but I didn't want to go there, is for example, for physical units. Because now it really makes it easy in this way to really make attributes as applicable to each column. Uh, I didn't want to go there because people are uh, very uh, sensitive to I have in my own way how I describe units and there's this way and that way, so I didn't want to go. But that would be, for example, one obvious possibility. I only reserved right, right now an attribute call a name description, again, for some kind of a bigger blob of text describing what that column means and represents. And I also try to protect all the RGF5 attributes that are used for dimension scale. So they're also considered reserved. Uh, there could be maybe others, but I couldn't remember right now, but we'll see. But other than that, everything else are free for all. And so this is the most basic content, which again is not rocket science, it's kind of sort of flow, it's obvious. Um, however, there is this issue of, I don't know if it's indexes or indices, so I went with indices, but let's see, maybe that's, that's not why. And so where to store them and what do they mean? Um, so here is the current approach that I see. It. Um, so they would have a separate group under the table group. And uh, and obviously any table index would again be an HDF5 data set. Um, right now, I didn't want to go say that they are also going to be one dimensional. Let's see, maybe not, maybe yes. Uh, I didn't want to specify the data types. Again, let's see what they represent and what they would be used for. Um, and, um, and so there will be this index group under the table group and then I thought perhaps would be also useful to group those uh, index data sets per date type into separate groups under the index group. Uh, and that's the main reason for that I thought is that instead of going through the list of data sets and checking their attributes to see which maybe index type they are, it's maybe easier to just break them down in the group so one can just name the group and get all the data sets there expecting that they represent the same type of indexes. And by same type of indexes, I'm thinking maybe, you know, you, you, you want to generate various indexes for various types of queries. I mean, the most generic and most traditional thing that I can write right now think of uh, is what, uh, what Postgres relational database calls block range index, which is kind of a fancy name for min max value. So in other words, I could imagine that one would have to store for the columns that are applicable, the minimum and maximum value of, of, of those column values in each chunk. So if someone asks for something, some selection goes uh, per 
column values, you would at least know which chunk actually you need to get the data from rather than going through all the chunks to find, uh, to check their value. And so there could be other types of indexes for other types of uses. And so I kind of, let, let, let's keep it undefined for now. Let's see how evolutionary gain, gain plays out in this space. Uh, the only thing that I was thinking to say here now would be that the column data set and, there are, and the applicable index data set could be connected essentially through dimension scale uh, feature of HDFI. Um, so any column data set could have any number of index data sets as their in the dimension scale. So that would basically allow that once you look at the column data set, immediately it would be easy to figure out oh, which are the data index data sets that, uh, that are applicable to this column data. Um, and that's basically all I have. Uh, the one thing that I didn't feel ready to write down anything about was, again, coming back to these variable length data types and columns with those, um, one of the one of the for example usage or needs here are uh, in geospatial tables uh, there are there are there is a there is a string based or textual based uh, description of of geospatial extent and that they they're called geopolygons in other words when you're trying to describe a kind of an area to which the the rows data applies to and and depend and uh, these geopolygons can have any number of vertices. So fundamentally, these geopolygons are variable length strings. And so that could be one, for example, that from my kind of more imminent domain where I would think about it, could benefit maybe from some better way to solve variable length data. And right now, I'm thinking: is there a possibility maybe that we store these columns with variable length data types? Uh, essentially, as 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 chunks within 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 the HDFI file, um, sort of to borrow from HSDS storage schema or ZAR that has sort of a separate chunk is a blob of bytes, uh, something like that, and keep it in the HDFI file. But I didn't want to go all the way there. I, I have to think a bit bit more and see if that makes sense or not. But other than that, this is this is what I have, uh, really. Um, so unless you have uh, questions and criticism and suggestions, um, <laughs> we can have a pretty short uh, session today. So I'm done. I think I'm a little bit confused about the index thing. So the index is a column. Um, well, it depends. What do you what do you think is index? What what in your mind represents an index? Well, what, I'm, what I'm, you would call an index? Right. Well, I, I'm thinking in terms of relational database here, right? So I'm thinking mm -hmm. of primary key. Maybe it's an, an integer. Let's say, um, you know, that would be one thing. But in, in another case, it could be a coordinate in three three D space or four D. Um, But I guess the <clears throat> so okay so let me let's see if we can help me differentiate between an alternative. So let's say I have a column that is my index. Why not just create an attribute that tells me which column or columns might be the index? Um, and and it may be more importantly in this case why what makes the index special here? Um, yeah, I cannot see the chat. So if anyone is um, all right. So well, here's the thing. Um, that's open for discussion. Obviously, all of this is open to discussion. Uh, to me, when I was thinking about this index. I thought to store something that's obviously zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's kind of why waste storage. Uh, if these only are going to be an enumeration of essentially from zero to whatever, 
Um, the other issue is if you adopt, if we kind of adopt this idea that um, that indexes or index data sets, wherever they may be or whoever, whatever they are, are essentially dimension scales to column data sets, then you would basically say, all right, then I could signal through that mechanism exactly which which um, which of these data sets are really considered to be an index to, to a specific column data set. Um, because when I was thinking about, as you say, these primary keys and whatnot, um, so why would be a column with primary key values be more important than any other column? I mean, if I need to use it to find the data for, I'm reading and writing is kind of the same thing for me. If it has a specific value, um, there may be another way to signal that there is a more specific value. For the index, this group and things, I was more maybe went in the direction of, these are now specifically design indexes for query uh, purposes. So when you really kind of, because in HDF5, there is no way for you to know where some element with certain value is. You have to touch every single value. And so that's where my mind went. But again, if people think that it's important to mention primary keys and that kind of stuff, uh, I'm all for it. I mean, this, you know, uh, it's all, this is very new and uh, very much open to, uh, to discussion and changes, community engagement. Yeah, yeah I think what you, you mentioned, right? And if this were a database, right, the index would be somehow optimized for retrieving a certain row. Um, and I'm not sure what that means or if we should even approach it in this case. Um, you know, at least it, for us, it might be just a hint that uh, that's what that's for, or maybe a hint on how to map it into a relational database. Um, You know, I guess the other thing that you could specify here, if, you know, an extended specification is is maybe something about the compression um, of that column. To me, yeah, again, right now I was thinking, let's keep index not too tightly specified and see again, as I said, where evolution takes it from there. But um, I would say any information that you think would be useful to find where the column values are and then be retrieved. Uh, and that's why I didn't want to go and say, well, index data should be one dimensional. Maybe they're not. They should have, you know, any, any, should they be compressed or not? Let's see how that plays out. In a way, this index group and everything underneath it is optional, obviously, if you just want sort of to, you know, uh, and I failed to mention that, but the optional things would be this index group. Um, and uh, and right now, nothing in HD5 library really uh, helps with reading or creating this kind of uh, uh, HD5 file content for people who have to develop their own software. But I thought first we start with the design and they said agree on profile or convention with everyone, and then we'll see you know how things go. Um, but yeah, I, I I think very often in my my world where I'm using it, I would really like to choose data set values per, you know, to do data set elements for their value. And there is no way in HD5 to do it now. Um, and so this chunk block range indexing, for example, um, many years ago when I was at a different company, I kind of did something like that. In, in, in PostgreSQL before they actually introduced it. Fortunately for me, uh, uh, as, as an as an indexing option, as an index type, but it, it turned to be very useful, very very useful, uh, because again, if it was very narrow set of values, it really sped, sped up things very very much. Uh, and so, um, based on that positive experience, that's why I thought about the index is an ability to. Go, you know, store indexes somewhere and be able to differentiate quickly between which are my data sets are really column values 
and which my data sets are really helpers here uh, in certain way. And that's why I, uh, yeah, so. Uh, As you, and if you look at the HDF5 road table specification, it's fairly simple. So I didn't want to go too much, you know, more than this, uh, obviously. Uh, less is, is, is better, I think. And I also looked at the uh, N, uh, N data Python package, which kind of um, was uh, my inspiration to do something about it. Uh, so I, I, I tried to make, for example, their, uh, their attributes that they kind of reserved still possible in this approach. Um, and uh, although I kind of diverted from index thing, I went a little too far um, there. Uh, and I couldn't find anything in pie tables really that they talk, at least as a, a brief time I tried to search, I couldn't find anything where they speak about indexes in pie tables, where they're stored and anything else. So I said, maybe they didn't, maybe they do, but uh, um, so yeah, so this is this is where I wanted to throw this idea out, and now the question is because this is done in my private internal company wiki uh, space, how we make this you know have more more public presence, for example, um, because I I'm I don't think that we as a company have any. In a really public forum for specifications and, and discussions of these things, and um, so that's something to think about. But first, obviously, if there will be any interest in this, something like this, because obviously, how many years now HD5 exists and HD5 library exists, and the world has not stopped turning without a column table HD5 specification. So maybe this is just too late to really mean something. And um, yeah, so that's basically what I have. Hi, hi everyone. Sorry, I was late and I missed this presentation. So um, I just want to uh, throw something here that we can discuss and think a little bit more. Um, we were, uh, John Minzer and I were talking with Quincy about sparse uh, data sets and um, I guess the idea of having different type of index is not um, is not bad at all. You know, when we discuss, so Quincy will say, "Yeah, let's let's add another type of index." And since uh, essentially columns, if you look at parquet files, right, there is a very sophisticated way how they divide, how they chunk, but more than that, how they index. And maybe we should think about a uh, native approach and really look into index, new indexing scheme in HDF5. And then all APIs will work the same. It, it's still chunk data set, it's still compression applied, but uh, index how you find and how you search will be different. I think it's worth the effort then create new high level approach, which is by the way, really nice. And um, Alexander, I, I to answer your question, I look at pie tables a long time ago, I believe, and they may be changed, they had index in the data set. And they were updating and maybe not even one index, they were building several indices uh, to facilitate the search, but it was data set and it was hidden from the users. But if you look with H5 dump, you will see those files. So this is just something thrown in. Um, I was looking at Parquet, um, maybe study a bit more how they do indexing and they have good experience now that we can steal a lot from them and put it uh, into HDF5. But Chan Combs concept is not, is already there. Um, it's just new indexing schema that will be completely uh, hidden from the users. First, hi, Lena. Uh, yes, I mean, I am. I I don't. Yeah, I'm not disagree on anything of that. Uh, one thing that is sort of always present in all these discussions: what should be done is uh, obviously the timeline of these things appearing and and what's the, you know, um, how much it would cost and who would be doing it. And so, uh, you know, the, my approach was the cheaper version 
which reuse whatever is available right now in the library. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, you know, if miraculously something happens in the next three months or whatever, but, you know, we are now way well into understanding the column-based data type, you know, uh, storage is very, very good and people use it and they're, they're widespread Eastern communities. Um, it, it's to me, it's always, okay, but when would that be in the library? And well, so if we can successfully answer that question, then obviously we can go in that direction to think. You, you know, it is um, like, um, I remember when high level libraries were created, it really took not very much time, but then people were complaining for 25 years how bad they are, right? <laughs> so we, <laughs> we, we, we're a little ready. Um, and uh, I, I think we should just have everything on the table and see, because maybe I'm dreaming, maybe that indexing will be hard to implement on HD5, but at least take a closer look um, and I kind of volunteered to do it anyway. Uh, and I miss uh, playing now with file formats, so it's uh, it's kind of fun. Um, and um, I think it can be put on forum and there, there were public conference pages where you can point uh, people, but also uh, just to have it on GitHub and share with community and people can comment there. It would, the best thing I think to do. Yes, yes, and what Mark, um, I just looked now at the chat, the, the link he posted, that's the czar specification specific <laughs> GitHub repository. And um, what uh, also comes the question then, um, uh, if we go in that approach, uh, the benefit of something like that would be that you suddenly can perhaps have a better um, presentation of these proposals. In other words, they're actually not just storing text in those repositories, they actually have a, a kind of a, neat, a static website in that repository. And so there, those document, those proposal documents are actually really nicely displayed and formatted. Uh, and so that would, but yeah, I, I agree with Mark, probably that would be something like that would be uh, probably the easiest because there's so many people with GitHub accounts now um, and we just, they just, they don't need another HDF specific account, for example, just to be able to participate in this discussion. So yes, uh, we could go in some direction like that. Um, yeah, so that's that basically. Um, I think we, unless more questions are or something, um, I'll try to, uh, Try to work towards in company getting some 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 guidance and decisions whether or not we want to start a repository of this kind of ideas and and then take it from there but uh, other than that um if you know uh, my email oh go ahead sorry yeah alexander it's gonna make an observation i mean uh there, there's nothing that really needs to be done software wise correct i mean anyone could start using this organization uh, today, right? Is there some kind of pen and software that has to be done? No, the, we only need to kind of agree so that whoever expands effort to implement something like this, mm -hmm. they, they, they have a peace of mind that we're not going to change our mind in the next three months or so, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It has to be some certainty and stability of this kind of specification and so people can say okay if i devote my free time in developing something you know it's not for nothing right right and um, uh, oh, while we're on this uh, page looking uh if we're talking about names it would be good uh, to have uh, something indicating hdf5 uh, in front or something because you may have clashes with uh, with other software because they may also use class version title description it's uh, so the well, names yes. use. Yes, mm -hmm. but then we do have we do have this specification with class and we use class in dimension scale. And we have well. we have a lot of we had a lot of complaints because it it did interfere with other definitions. Well, so, we came we, we, we used it first. Okay. Because we are HDF group, they have to come up with something different. You know, ding, ding, we, we claim div on this attribute name. Uh, but yeah, even pie tables is using class as well. 
And so I kind of felt, you know, well, it, it, it's kind of standard by itself, I think. Uh, but yeah, I mean, again, I'm willing to change anything if we have a really community engagement with this. Uh, you know, all of this can change, absolutely. I have no problem. Um, the only thing, if we want to really do the community way, we have to have certain rules so the community participants know how their contribution and comments are going to be processed and, you know, we have some more 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 official way of, 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 of describing the rules of engagement here and so that people know that their time and effort are not wasted but other than that um you know that's basically uh, all i'm saying and um yeah and you're right, John. I mean, this again, we, we discussed even internally in the company this for some time now, with the column data sets and whatnot. So this is nothing really revolutionary here. It's just, again, I'm trying to make efforts to finally stabilize and agree upon something and then and then um, move forward. And, and if AGF5 library can get there, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, but again, that there is this timeliness thing, you know, meeting the historical moment. That's also something to consider. And um, and so uh, we'll see how it goes. All right. And with that, um, if no one has any more um, questions or um, or suggestions, um. um. Well, I think I, I'm still trying to think about this in relation to to other other things. So I mentioned relational database, you know, so it, it might be good to figure out how do you, you know, if one had a table schema from Postgres or a SQL light, how would you map it to this? Um, because I think that that could be an application that, that this is just, this could be used as an interchange format to export tables. Um, into other kinds of software that maybe are using already using HCL5. Um, the other thing is um, the other side that for this we talked about parquet a little bit last time would be mm -hmm. Apache Arrow or um, or Polars now, um, which is this Rust Python um, data frame library, right? And I think that's mm -hmm. that's another application for uh, for this, right? And that's a slightly different application because they, they're they talking about inter-process communication. Um, you know, so basically you could you imagine if we had this HR5 file, we memory map it, and, um, you know, could we just take the these columns and, and load them directly into memory and work with them there? Um, and so I, I'm kind of thinking about what is the, is, is this actually compatible with that already? Could we, you know, could we design this in such a way uh, that we keep the columns contiguous so that we could use Apache Arrow compliant uh, clients to also read this format? And I think that becomes really interesting at that point because suddenly we don't need people to do something special for this new format, we we just we have this hybrid thing that just happens to also be an HTML5 file, but people could also use Apache Arrow to read it, and and then this thing becomes, um, I think, a, a different beast. So I would, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. No, all good uh, suggestions, Mike. Um, is Polar RS or Polar S? Because I know that RS is usually you know popular with Rust. But they never, you know, whatever. But yeah, I heard of that. Um, I'm, uh, as far as I'm familiar with Parquet, um, this should pretty much come close to Parquet. Although Parquet as a format, as a file format, is kind of designed to be more uh, appendable. Uh, and there, there are some other features that HDF5 files by themselves cannot achieve, that polar uh, parquet file format can achieve. But if you look into the way how data is stored, I think the only difference that we do not kind of have, and again, we can, we can 
we can decide to change the storage here to more match Parquet in some ways. But I think Parquet right now can attach attributes to each column chunk. I think that's where they differ. Whereas in HDF5, again, by they're just using what's currently available in HDF5 library and HDF5 data model, you 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 can only attach attributes to entire HDF5 data. Whereas I think PyK allows you to actually attach attributes to its chunk, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but again, the, 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 the point of these structures and contents is that really um, we can agree whatever we want, how we want to store things using HDF5 library primitives. And you know the data set, the group, the other, I consider them kind of primitives in terms of data storage. And so how we decide to assign meaning to certain things is really however we want to approach it. Um, in terms of this kind of in-memory inter-process communication format, yes, there is a bunch of them. For example, I know one that's called ONNX, which is the open neural network exchange format, for example, uh, which seems to again be designed sort of to send information to some processes or things rather than really keep it as a file format or something. Uh, I, I think they all uh, represent certain desire of different communities to design something simpler. Uh, but again, they, they agree on the file format and then they go with different implementation as software. So I think the approach is a little different here. We, we kind of think here that there is HD5 library as a, as a foundation of all of these capabilities. Um, but again, uh, and so everything goes above HDF5 library in terms of implementation, not below HDF5 library. But yeah, I mean, um, well, yeah, I, I, I feel it, like yeah, go, I think it could ahead. be both, go. right? So I, I think it. The, the question is: Is it possible to lay out the HDF5 file in a way that could also be uh, an arrow? Um, uh, and well, yeah, but in, in an arrow memory format, um, if it were kind of memory mapped, um, which means it, you know, there's there's an intersection there. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that all um, all um, all files that are compliant with the HDF5 column table specification, as you see that here, would be compatible with it. But but it just means that if we configure the HDF5 in a particular way. Could we make it um, compatible, right? Because I think I think there's some mentions in the HF5 documentation that it's meant to be possibly embedded within another file format, um, and so I'm you know, instead of forcing people to write new software to read your specification, if you could find intersections with existing software, mm. you know that would one make it easier to use your the specification um and you know decrease a lot of work for others and i think that's possible at the same time it'll also kind of give asia 5 access to a, possibly a pool of um of data that you know, is currently not accessible from asia 5. So. all good stuff no the point, I think, generally speaking, uh, it really would come down to community engagement. I mean, I, I think we would really benefit from from vivid discussions in these things because even within HDF group, you cannot see all the entire field of how people use and where they try to apply HDF five library or software and HDF five files and everything else. And so, um, for this kind of again, looking at this sort of idea. Um, I thought let's start relatively humble and simple and then see how it can go forward. I, I think the most important difference is that again, um, this at least allows you to do some kind of mapping between other column based formats or the software and into the HDF5 file content. Uh, previously, when you had a compound data type as, as, a, as a column representation, uh, that was not possible just because how the bytes are laid out in, in each chunk. Um, and so, yeah, so I think this comes closer to that goal that you talk about. 
Um, Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Very helpful. And I'll I'll uh, try to work in the, within the company to see if we can do some some GitHub repository for this kind of specifications, profiles, whatever we want to call them, um, that is more open and more visible uh, publicly. Right. I mean, I think what the what the Star folks are using is this Sphinx software. You know, that's usually used to generate um, documentation for Python projects. But, you know, perhaps in, in this case, you're already using Doxygen. Um, so I'm be kind of curious if uh, you could use Doxygen to lay out a, a spec as well. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm um, smiling, but I'm screaming inside when you mentioned Doxygen, but, uh, <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, but uh, but otherwise, um, no. I mean, you know, I've I've had a number of these markup text formats. Um, yeah, I, so, I think yeah, we need to choose one. So these days, I think um, markdown has become really popular, right? Because it's basically plain text, but also has some structure to it. Um, I think maybe restructured text that Sphinx uses is maybe the slightly older version. Um, but, um, but yeah, that makes it really simple to, to at least edit the files in a common way. I, I use even FTDoc. doc. Um, I, I mean, that's my favorite personal, but I'm not imposing that. Um, I, I like FTDoc doc because I think it was, a, a nice balance between really good features and the syntax that was, um, uh, very easy on the eyes and very doable for people. Um, for example, where structured text is good, but I hate how it insert links and notes and especially tables. I mean, tables and restructured text just awful. At least for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, and um, and Markdown kind of comes to me a little too simple, too too under the you know. If I'm if I'm writing technical spec documentation, I really like you know. To have a little bit more, more um, power and capability here, um, but again, I'm I'll, I'll I'll you know let the majority. I'm okay. I'll adopt. You know, just my personal opinion. Um, you know, Alexander, I suggest when you put the documents, we also ask question to describe use cases, how people and how they want to map with different software. Without use cases, it will be really difficult to make any decision. Like what they want to do, for example, map to SQL or have easy access and really describe what they're trying to achieve. Okay, all right, good point. All right then, well, um... I don't know, is it time to wrap up? Um, <laughs> the USA Champions League broadcast has already started. Who is watching European soccer and cares about that? Um, so, um, so I don't know, we can talk. I enjoy talking or we can wrap up wherever people uh, feel. Any more comments and suggestions? Oh, sounds good. Okay, we'll, right, we'll, well get this up and let people know about it on the forum so they can start contributing, working on it. And we will need uh, something for Sparse 2 to share. So it will be good to have repository where things can go from the community. OK. All right, Thank then. thanks, everyone. Thanks mm -hmm. for comments and questions. And uh, we'll keep you posted. All right, take care. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Bye.